Hey guys, and welcome to another episode. Today I have the pleasure and the honor of being joined by Mr. Marshall Long, who is um, one of the co-founders of BP Fish. And Marshall has been in the game for a long time. Um, I know we're here to talk about BP Fish, but before we get into that, Marshall, I want to talk a little bit about you. I understand that uh, you kind of came into the mining game really early, and um, you know, and and you you have quite the reputation in the mining game. What kind of what took you into that, and then eventually like into cryptocurrency, and then down the rabbit hole into EOS? Sure. So uh, I used to be an engineer, actually, a structural engineer, um, and uh, then I slowly started learning about how to dev and, and I became an engineer and then I, while I was still an engineer, I became a developer because I found out how to automate basically 90% of my job. Um, and so that kind of led me down the rabbit hole of development. And, uh, at, at one point I was working on an iPhone app that would like track your golf club while you're swinging. And, and it was at lunch with half the team and, um, my, one of my buddies brought up. Bitcoin and he was like man I was doing some research and I found out about this Bitcoin stuff it's like nerd money you got to check it out so I started reading the white paper and I got really kind of obsessed with it not because of you know the implications monetarily but more on the nerd side so uh, I immediately dismantled my PC rebuilt it and figured out how to mine um, because I tried to buy some first and like the buying process is just, there was nothing really around and the stuff that was around was super sketchy. So I just was like, all right, I'll just mine some. Um, and then slowly, well, maybe not even really slowly. I maxed out all the power in my house in Houston. The wife got not so happy and uh, told me I needed to figure out something else. And so we, me and, and some other guys I'd worked with before uh, as an engineer, we, we, started building out a place in Texas and then slowly kind of branched out from there internationally. So basically the wife was a catalyst to do it professionally because I don't like sleeping on the couch. So, um, uh, after that, uh, Ethereum came out, which was super interesting. Um, and there were some attempts to kind of do cool stuff on Bitcoin, but nothing kind of really panned out just due to the government governance structure and, kind of egos at play and stuff like that in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Um, and then I found out about EOS and at first I was uh, very skeptical, I'd say. Um, first person I heard it from was Brock Pierce and he was basically telling me about, um, he was coming from a standpoint of this could be like an Ethereum killer. And at the time, Ethereum was really going gangbusters. I was like, man, that's a crazy thing to say. And so I just kind of wrote it off and just didn't really think about it. Um, and then last year, I think, yeah, last year at uh, a private event called Satoshi Roundtable, one of my partners from the mining game, he said, man, you really got to look at this stuff. And I told him, no, I think it's stupid. And he said, okay, this, did, did you actually look at the code? Like, have you seen it? And I said, no. So he took his laptop and he said, look at this, stop being stupid. And so I started looking through things and coming from Bitcoin where block times are 10 minutes, the first thing I saw was half second block times. And I, how is that even possible? And then I, that just kind of sucked me right in. Um, and, and here we are. Yeah, it's always the wives, hey? Kill all yeah, the yeah. yeah. We just find new and inventive ways to uh, screw ourselves over. That's right. Apparently it worked out, so that's good. Yeah, it worked out great. And uh, it's funny, if you ever ask my wife how much she knows about blockchain tech or crypto, she'll always say, I'm really good at spending it, and I know how to spend it really well. I'm like, all right, well, <laughs> it's good enough. <laughs> yeah, exactly, man. Um, let's talk about your background a little bit, because I understand that you also spend quite a bit of your time doing comedy, which is kind of an awesome comp combination, right? You've got crypto. Yeah, so that's actually something fairly new. Um, so with some people I actually went to high school with and actually the drama teacher from my high school, um, we started a nonprofit in Dallas, actually. That is a, it's actually the only nonprofit uh, comedy theater in uh, Texas, I think. Could be wrong about that, but for sure in Dallas. And it's, uh, we do things like teach comedy and improv to kids with special needs. Uh, we do like corporate events, like all kinds of stuff. It's uh, really interesting. 
Yeah. Really cool. It's called the Dallas Stomping Ground. It's really, really awesome. Yeah, does that help you survive in this industry? You've got to have a sense of humor, right? No, it's, it's funny. You, you can kind of pinpoint the people who haven't been in crypto for a long time because crypto has been always a really crazy place, up, down, technological craziness and people that are even more crazy. And if you don't have a sense of humor, you'll just fry your brain. So um, in these EOS chats, what, what's really cool about EOS is there's a lot of people who weren't in crypto before EOS for reasons of like, I've heard reasons from like lawyers who have said, you know, that there wasn't just a, it just wasn't good enough in Ethereum and EOS. So they've put their whole lives in EOS. I've heard all kinds of stories, marketeers, uh, Kevin from EOS New York. He's a good example of that too. He used to be a really prestigious uh, marketer. And, uh, but you can always tell the people who haven't been in crypto for a long time, because in the middle of a really heated debate or something, uh, the, the old timey crypto people, myself included, will crack a joke and people will be like, why can't you take this seriously? <laughs> he's up, he's up, we'll get through it. No, it's, uh, it's a necessity for sure. Yeah, I have to agree with you, man. Um, I know Kevin, I like Kevin, good dude. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's cool. Like it's kind of providing a lot of opportunities uh, to different people to kind of hop in the game. It's like, it's, I think a lot of people think it's late. Like it's not late. This is not late. This is still the time to, uh, to get your feet wet. And EOS is just such a welcoming, accommodating community to do that. Yeah, the, the person I think who said it the best when asked this is actually a friend of mine, Roger Ver. I, I heard him say this to somebody. He said, is it too late to get into, this is way back, is it too late to get into Bitcoin? And his response was, that's like asking, is it too late to get into the internet? Yeah, yeah, it's a good response. Good. Yeah. Good analogy. Um, mm -hmm. We're still, I, I still feel like we're still so fresh. Well, um, let's talk a little bit about where you grew up. Like, were there any kind of experiences that Little Marshall had that, uh, you know, formative experiences that might have led you along this road? Like, did you know, I'm going to be in EOS, I'm going to be a miner? Like, how did it all kind of come together? I would say in the early days, I kind of had an affinity for tech, and that kind of stems from my grandfather, actually. He, um, he was actually on the team that developed Radar. And... Um, he would show me things, all kinds of crazy stuff. Like uh, when satellite TV first came out, he was one of the first people to figure out how to hack the little like satellite SIM cards that gave you access to the satellites. And so he had free satellite TV forever. So he was just like a hacker dude. And I learned a lot from him. And then uh, of course, building PCs in uh, high school and college, playing games. I'm a big gamer, also run an esports company. So um, my life's kind of always been around tech. And this was just kind of like, tech plus one so um and then eos is kind of like crypto plus one so uh i like being on the bleeding edge of uh, tech and also disrupt disruption stuff just because status quo is stupid and people get lazy um so like i own companies like i own a drone company um esports is pretty disruptive too and, and of course crypto so um i guess i just like disrupting things so uh, yeah. That plus crypto is perfect. It is. Crypto is amazing. I also have a, I'm also into drones. I do a ton of drone videos and footage right on. in Costa Rica here. So I've got my DJI Phantom 4. Oh, yeah. I'm going to buy one of the bad boys soon, those 7,000 Mammer Jammers. Oh, yeah. Really? We, got, uh, we run like a, a lot of S1000 pluses, stuff like that. Yeah. Like the full uh, GH4 setup. But uh, man, I bet Costa Rica's got some crazy stuff you can film for sure. Woof. If you ever, uh, if you ever make your way out here, come out and we'll we'll geek out and we'll have a couple of you have to. Crash so cool. <laughs> um, I guess like I notice you're really active in the community. You know, you're always kind of out there. Um, I think that you're very well liked um, and very well respected because of a lot of the things that you've done. How does interacting with the community make your day to day a little bit more enjoyable? So it's um, the the whole reason outside of the tech that I got into EOS is because. Uh, the community reminds me a lot of Bitcoin in like 2010, 2011, when it was just a bunch of people and friends just kind of like hacking on stuff and making really cool stuff. So if you've not actually been to a, like a EOS on conference, there haven't been that many, but uh, if you get a chance, you'll, it's just like an energy to this thing that uh, is, is really cool. And it's it, one of the reasons why I like esports too, it's, um, it doesn't matter who you are or where you're from or how much money you have. Uh, it just matters that it's, it's, it's about the tech. 
And one thing you see in, in EOS a lot is there's not actually a whole lot of bashing on other projects. Like I, I know in the early days it was more like, oh, EOS is an Ethereum killer. It's not even really about that anymore. It's just kind of its own, we're just doing our thing and everybody else can do their thing and that's cool too. And um, it's, there's, there's very little toxicity in the community, which is great. I mean, you could just look at the subreddits. That's all you need to say. If you look at the EOS subreddit compared to the BTC or the Bitcoin or the Ethereum subreddit, they're always talking about something else. And, and the EOS one's always talking about like the, the cool stuff we're building and, and all this stuff. So, yeah. What, what would you say makes a strong block producer? Of course, VP Fish being um, one of the top block producers right now. And what, Marshall, makes a crappy block producer? So I would say a good block producer, it's all about like what, what your platform is, right? So when a lot of people ask me, you know, what, what, uh, what can I do to attract votes? It's, it's more about your platform. What, what do you as a company stand for? What do you guys like to do? Um, so we're pretty community focused. We have a pretty decently sized telegram. I think it's coming up on a thousand members, which for a BP is, is on the bigger side. Um, it's so our platform is all about community and I want to build stuff that our community wants to use. So, um, some of the tools we're building were spurred from, from listening to people. Um, a lot of other people, they, that, that are great block producers, they like to run their own infrastructure in their own data centers. Uh, for instance, like EOS metal, yep. really great example of that. They literally run all their own stuff. We run bare metal, but it's co-located in data centers, stuff like that. But I'm pretty sure like, they even own the racks in the data center, which is like whole another next level. They do all their own networking and all that stuff. Um, some people like to do uh, optimizations. Uh, so like Graymass is a great example of that. Their Graymass wallet, which I just downloaded today, I had no idea. It is everything you could ever want to do and interact with the EOS ecosystem and more. Um, and they run like crazy hardware. They're overclocked all their stuff. Like they're always at the bottom of the benchmark. Uh, well, so being at the bottom, like the lowest CPU time at the benchmarks. So like they're really all about super hyper optimization. Um, some people like to build like diagnostic tools like uh, EOS Titan. They're a good example of that. They've got a really great portal with like a bunch of different uh, tools you can use to kind of check out and tweak. Aloha EOS, same kind of thing. They have a bunch of like research tools you can use. So really just is about like what your passion is as a company and, and what, you, what you want to target on. And then whatever you say is your philosophy, just make sure you're really good at that and you stick to that. I would say that's, that's what makes a great block producer. Uh, what makes a crappy one, I would say is, um, Lack of communication, maybe. There's a lot of people who don't really interact. Um, there's, uh, I would say, not sticking to your message is probably an important one because if people don't like your messaging, they'll just pull your votes. Yeah. Um, that's the great thing about EOS. If you're actually really crappy, you'll start to see the rankings go down over time. Um, and that's kind of the, the beautiful part. It's similar to mining in that regard. You know, as more people get on the network, the difficulty goes up. Um, and in this regard, as you become crappier and crappier, your votes go down. So it's very similar. Yeah. My, my next question was actually kind of tied into that. And it was essentially, have you learned anything in mining that's helped you in, in DPoS? Have you taken any? Yeah, risk? actually, I, I will say that, um, I was one of the first people to run that, that wasn't Chinese to run large scale operations in Chinese in, yeah. in China. Um, and so, uh, the business culture in China is so different than anywhere else. Uh, so learning the different business cultures because a lot of the interaction we have is online over text and being able to understand text in a, a form, uh, being able to kind of know where people come from helps a lot in translating the text into comprehending it because a lot of people will see text and get really freaked out. Um, when in reality it's probably means something different. So I would say, um, that, that's helped a lot in crypto just because most of the interactions on text online, which can also often be misinterpreted. So yeah, I'm sure different cultures communicate differently. And then when they're trying to translate it into English, this goes sideways quickly. So yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. And there's some good VPs. There's some good Chinese VPs out there who are really communicative and, uh, and work yeah. hard, but yeah, it's two different cultures. Definitely 
um, helps to have kind of that background. What do you think is working in EOS right now? Like what's, what's working, what's broken? So what I think is, is working, and I think this is going to be a disputed uh, case, but I, the, another reason I really like EOS is because the governance is front loaded. Okay. So all the issues we have now, not really tech issues, like in Bitcoin, it was, well, we had a hard fork. How do we fix it? Um, so like the first three or four years of the Bitcoin life cycle was all about code, code. Let's make this thing fast. Let's make it awesome. Let's make it robust. Uh, but in EOS that was kind of already done. And so day one, it was more about governance, right? So the, the big thing with EOS that's, uh, I think puts it ahead of the rest is it's all the governance kind of issues that Bitcoin has and Ethereum has and every major blockchain has all those issues are front loaded and we're getting through all those issues at the beginning, as opposed to let's make the project a huge mega success because at that point it's way too hard to kind of decouple the governance from the project because everybody's made so much money and, and everybody's, everybody hates each other by that point. So um, I think that's, what's really working is the communication in EOS is incredible. You can, Talk to anybody. I, I had a conversation with a, with a guy today. He's brand new to EOS. And he said, man, everybody here is just so welcoming and really nice. And that's, he can get his questions answered. And if I have an issue about a proposal or something, I can pick up the phone and call somebody and they're not going to just like ignore the call. So I, I think communication is great. And that helps with the governance, getting all the sticky stuff out of the way first. Yeah. Um, what's broken? It's a good question. Um, off the top of my head, I would say the, the user experience could be better. Um, we're actually putting out an article, I think, tomorrow or the next day, maybe a video um, to kind of help people get onboarded easier. Because right now it's kind of a hassle to get an account name and to learn how to vote and get your private keys and all this kind of stuff. So with, with Bitcoin, you can just download an app and get, get your payments. But since EOS is more than just a payment mechanism, uh, there's a lot more to it to enable to interact with it completely. So I think that's probably the biggest thing that's slowly being worked on, which is great. I noticed that in this industry, whenever I speak to people like yourself and you've done really well, like you've come a long way. Um, I'm sure you've worked very hard to get there, but everybody kind of has a mentor. Is there somebody that stands out for you as a mentor or somebody who's kind of helped to guide your career? Yeah, you know, uh, some of the early uh, Bitcoin guys have helped a lot. Uh, Charlie Shrim. Um, he's a, he's a really big crypto OG guy. He's kind of helped me a lot cause he's way more into like the political side and stuff that I used to really not give a crap about. Um, so I would say Charlie's helped a lot. Um, from the, the legal side, people like uh, Marco Santori, he's, uh, kind of shown me that government can be good and bad. Um, uh, I would say Brian from Coinbase. He's a good guy. He, I tried to do a project in 2015 called Bitcoin Classic. That I learned a lot of lessons from him during Bitcoin Classic. Um, so I, I would say those three guys. Roger's also a good one. He's uh, never afraid to speak his mind, which is good most of the time. Um, but uh, yeah, I would say those those are a few. There's there's of course more, and I, and I meet new people. Every day, especially in EOS, there's a, a lot of really crazy talented people in EOS that I'm learning a lot from too, so the more the merrier. Absolutely. I, I kind of get the impression from you um, after chatting with you for a little bit that you're, you know, like you're focused and you're accomplished, um, but you're also like, you also probably need to keep busy by, you know, doing different things and working on multiple projects. Is that like a fair assumption or am I missing the mark? Yeah, uh, my wife would say it's because I'm ADHD, but really it's just because um, I like to tie all my projects kind of together. So like the eSports company, a lot of the players that, that play for us, they get paid in crypto. Um, some of the sponsors there are, are crypto companies. Um, it, it's I, I like to kind of keep everything because the more projects you can tie into other things, the more legit everything kind of seems, right? So when crypto first came out, everybody, I could not get on a flight without somebody asking if I was a drug dealer after I told them I was in Bitcoin. And now you're starting to see that change, right? With companies like Fidelity coming online and, and a bunch of other big institutions coming. So um, I, I think 
having my hands on a lot of different things gives me better perspective instead of just kind of being tunnel visioned into crypto and not really knowing outside use cases. So I would say crypto is my, uh, my heart, uh, video games is my hobby, uh, but disruption is kind of my life. So <laughs> I love it, man. That's awesome. Um, and of course drones, don't forget drones. We have that. Oh, yeah. Drones is just awesome. <laughs> yeah. And I agree. Um, like it's cool to be out here living in Costa Rica, but if I couldn't, um, I've lost about four Mavics already cause I'm, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm well, I'll tell you the one thing you really don't have to deal with is the FAA. That's Our it. drone company is completely federally licensed and everything. And we still got to deal with FAA stuff. So, yeah. uh, four Mavics is a cheap price to pay for that. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. I just, I don't even bad an eye anymore. I'm like, Oh, there was another one. Oh, there's another one. Yeah. What are you going to do? Yeah. Um, what do you think sets, uh, what do you think sets BP fish apart from the others? I would say the, the experience level, um, there aren't a whole lot of people that have not only experience in crypto. Uh, my partners are, uh, the CTO of F2 pool Wing Chun, yep. and, uh, another one of my partners, he's the CEO of full B Korea. So they've been in, and, and I've been in crypto, I think the longest 2010 Wing Chun got in 2011 and Zago Fong got in, uh, I think 2013. So um, from a crypto side, we have a lot of experience. But the, the other thing is the, the cultural side. Um, our entire company is super internationalized. So our, our senior DevOps guy is American. Our senior architect's American. Uh, I am too. Our marketing guy is South African. Uh, our other marketing guy is Israeli. Bunch is Chinese, but he lives in Thailand. So I'll go Fong's Korean. So, I mean, we've got a, a whole good melting pot that I feel represents kind of the world at large. And so our experience across borders helps us be able to kind of see what different populations need or want uh, and be able to kind of facilitate communication really effectively that way. I noticed, um, I noticed that there's a lot of new dApps coming out. And the, the thing that I really enjoy about EOS is uh, some of these dApps have some really significant socioeconomic impact. Like they're doing some really cool things. Um, what would you say your, your favorites are right now? So I would say my favorites in terms of um, user engagement would be uh, the gambling dApps. Just because the sheer magnitude of those things it's so crazy the volume these things are hitting. I'm literally looking on one right now and they're processing like 30 million EOS per week. That's insane. And they've been out for two months. Um, the, the, the big one for me, I think, is uh, Nudex. They're an exchange. I just used them, I would say, three or four days ago. UX is really nice. Uh, and the cool thing about a decentralized exchange is you don't have to worry about people hacking your funds. Um, you know, order settlements really quick and effective and it's not input and withdrawal. Um, none of these things were really accessible before EOS, in my opinion. Ethereum was fast, but I mean, coming from the, an eSports perspective, nobody's going to wait 30 seconds or a minute to play a game, much less deal with their money. Um, so if you can execute a decentralized exchange in a second, that's much better UX. So um the exchanges are really cool and some of the video games are really nice too um just saw one today monsters eos monsters something like that just really really cool um it's kind of like amped up crypto kitties which is nice um so yeah i mean there's there's a ton of volume on these which um is a great sign because the network can handle it just fine yeah i keep losing monsters i like i get to them i'm just a terrible monster parent and yeah. gone man like you remember early early days those tamagotchis he yeah so my mom took that away from me when i was a kid because they kept dying and she's like <laughs> i want you to clean up the poops and all this stuff so yeah we're in the same boat there yeah like i commit to them like i'm into it and then i just get busy man. so and you come in so hot you're like oh this is gonna be great i'm gonna be so many it's gonna be so powerful it's gonna be awesome and then you're just like a week later you're like nah we're done here we're done. that's the life cycle of a tamagotchi man one week <laughs> Um, you guys wrote a really interesting article, actually, which I caught on Medium, and it had to do with uh, the differences between kind of Ethereum and Bitcoin. How do you think EOS can change the way that we interact with digital assets? So, uh, for first, 
the first thing I would say is the speed. Um, it enables a whole lot of other levels of interaction. So um, you can actually do timings with block times and all kinds of other like super low level programmatic stuff that you couldn't do on Ethereum. Um, there, there's a, a whole other world that opens and, and most of my devs have tried, they came from the Bitcoin world. They tried to work with Solidity on Ethereum and now they're on EOS and they feel like EOS reminds them more of the Bitcoin days, uh, which they prefer. That's just super biased. But uh, it, what's interesting is our, our newest hire, uh, he's a guy I actually grew up with. He's a really rock star dev, knows over 10 languages really well, but really didn't get into crypto. And so his name's Dan. Dan messaged me on Facebook maybe a year ago. He said, hey, you know any of the guys at Ripple? I want to start working at Ripple to get into crypto. And immediately I freaked out, right? Because I'm a super <laughs> crypto idealistic guy. And I said, you don't want to work at Ripple, call me. So, um, so he started, his, his first foray into crypto is EOS. And generally, the time to ramp up developers for crypto, we're talking years. That's why anytime you get a great dev, you do everything you can to keep them because it is like pulling teeth to train new ones just because it's so, the paradigm's so new. Um, but with EOS, there's a lot of similarities to the professional world that Dan comes from. Um, and so he's working on our, uh, our, basically our EOS storage system called HODL, HODL Long. Um, and he's taken it from zero to damn near finished in about two to three months. So um, for a guy that has really deep technical prowess but hasn't touched crypto before, it's a big deal. So that, that alone is a huge asset to the community because it's easier to onboard developers. Yeah. What exactly is Hotalong? It's, it's, how does that work? Yeah, so it's, um, if you're familiar with IPFS, it's kind of like a decentralized storage system. But this is more uh, along the lines of EOS-centric. So um, when it launches, we'll have two terabytes free and anybody can spin up their own node to host storage themselves and charge whatever they want. We won't charge for ours, but I'm sure as our storage gets full, people will launch their own nodes and stuff. But basically, it's uh, through WebTorrent, we'll split the package up so it's super encrypted and anonymized so I can't see the data or anything like that. Um, and then the hashes are stored on EOS, and so you, when you wanna store or pull down something from basically this decentralized storage, uh, you just can sign the hash and, and that's how you verify your ownership. So it's fully de encrypted, decentralized file storage on EOS. That's probably the best way to say it. Very cool. It sounds like you're so busy, man. I, I want to know, and I think a lot of people want to know, um, what do you do for fun when you're not working? Things I do for fun when I'm not working, I would say I play a lot of video games. Uh, it's a great excuse, too, because I own an esports company when the wife says, why aren't you working? I'm just like, oh, I'm just work. I'm just doing research on a new game. It's fine. Um, uh, I like to go fishing quite a bit. Um, I live in Boston now, so the fishing days are short here. But um, it's interesting coming from Texas, living in Boston. All the states in the north are so small; you can like go between all of them within an hour. There's a lot of really great scenery, so me and my wife like to hike around a lot. Um, so, like in the winter, we like to hike up uh, some of the mountains in Vermont. Um, and I would say hanging out with friends, I like to travel. Of course, that's kind of part of the job now, so that that works well going to all the conferences and stuff. So, yeah. Um, I guess when do you think we're going to see EOS adoption, and what are some of the obstacles that are in place? So, I would say from a development standpoint, EOS adoption is happening now. Yes. There's a lot of uh, crypto companies that are putting their DApps on top of EOS. Um, I don't really consider that adoption, though. I consider that more migratory. Uh, what I'd like to see is it uh, more uh, outside world coming in. So uh, in London, I met with a lot of people who had not gotten into crypto before. We got into EOS because they saw something different. Uh, that's a good sign. And the more we can kind of, I think Block One's doing a great job at advertising and uh, running all these great hackathons and getting the word out, which will attract developers, which will then attract end users. Um, and and there's a lot of cool things happening now that have never really happened for Bitcoin. Um, and that's things like 
really great applications that obfuscate the use of crypto, but it's all happening on the back end for the people that really care. Um, a lot of the gambling sites, for instance, you only know it's crypto because it's denominated in crypto, right? It's, they could use whatever token and it's just another gambling site and you would never know that. Um, but they use it to do like provably fair stuff and, and the things so you know they're not scamming you and all that kind of stuff. EOS Bet does a great job of that. Um, so I think the, the biggest hurdle we have to solve is the on-ramp period. Like I said, account names is still kind of a rough thing to wrap your head around, um, especially for people who have been in crypto and not just people who aren't into crypto. Um, as soon as we can kind of get those things sorted, I think we'll see a, a, the, the hockey stick start to form. What do, you, uh, what do you typically look for if you're looking for an investment? If, uh, if you're going to invest in a company or a particular cryptocurrency, what are some of the things that you look for and what are some of the red flags? So for a hard asset, I look for things like um, what's the historical price, which like crypto is a terrible example of that, right? Um, uh, for, for a cryptocurrency, if I'm going to invest into the, the, the asset or the token, I look for things like what's the team like, what have they done in the past, um, what's their follow through look like? Cause I, I'm not really a long, uh, a super, super long term investor, but I'm not a super short term investor. I don't do like a whole lot of scalping, stuff like that. So I want to see, you know, in three years, five years, are these guys still going to be working on this thing? Uh, if so, that's a great sign. Cause that means they're still committed. Um, and th and that's the same for equity based companies, right? So what's their business model look like? How do they plan on making money? How do they plan on being self-sufficient? What do the economics look like? How do they plan to scale? And crypto companies specifically, scaling is a big deal. So I've invested in a few crypto companies. And that's always been my first question is, is how do you take this thing from today to going 10x the user base? How do you, you know, not hit stumbling blocks along the road, that kind of stuff. So I think scaling from an equity play standpoint and, and, and even from a hard, like a token acquisition standpoint is a big factor. Absolutely, man. I agree. What do you think are the things that are kind of making and breaking some of the projects out on EOS right now? Um, speed, of course, I think is making everything a lot easier. Um, block producer variance makes things hard. Sometimes if a block producer CPU is messed up, people will have 100% CPU usage and they can't interact with the chain. So I think that uh, BPs could do a better job, ourselves included. Um, but if you look at like the benchmark graphs over like the past month, you'll see everything kind of consolidating to a really low level. So that's a really great sign. Um, but since the BP run the chain, any mess up they have affects the end user, right? So I think that's priority number one. You need to maintain a stable network so that people can use you reliably. Um, I, I would say that's probably the, the biggest thing. What do you, um, what's something people might not know uh, when they're going to place their votes about BP fish? Something you might not know. Um, I would say we're maybe the most easygoing BP. Our chat's always full of people putting all kinds of memes and stuff. And um, um, if people know me, they probably can get that vibe, but um, I would say that, that we probably have the most easygoing uh, group around. People come in all the time, cracking jokes. And uh, a guy, <laughs> it's funny, a, a guy made, uh, one of our community members, his name's Duncan, he made these little keychains that are in the shape of a fish, and his, he's got a laser cutter. And uh, he inscribed on them, in COD we trust, instead of in code we trust. The very next day, my partner, Wen Chun, went and got the name, the account name, in COD we trust. So... Uh, it's all about having fun, making something cool, not taking it too seriously, but, uh, you know, just making sure we're really good at our job too. I, I think that's something that's hard to relay over text. And yeah, for sure. And you've got to make it approachable too. Like you were saying, onboarding new users and like breaking things down. And that's one of the things that the community is really accomplishing well, I guess. One thing that um, we're maybe not doing as well as we could be refers to a little bit of voter apathy. Why do you think that people are apathetic and not everybody? We have lots of, we do have lots of voting, but um, we do see a lot of voter apathy. Why do you think that's happening? And what do you think we could do to change that? So I think it's a combination of things. Um, 
some of it may not even be apathy. It might just be not being educated um, on like what EOS is, because if you look at it in the group of all the other things, it's just another token, right? Um, so I think education is a part of it. Um, secondly is I know there is a lot of people like maybe even upwards of 10% of the network supply that are waiting for like a really nice hardware token integration. Uh, so like the ledger wallet, it's kind of clunky to use with EOS. Um, and people are waiting, a lot of large hedge funds are waiting too in order to just operate off their, their hardware wallets. Um, so I, I think uh, that's a part of it. And the other part is there are a lot of people, especially since November, December of last year, that just don't care. They're just in it to kind of day trade it, make cash on it. And EOS compared to a lot of other assets is among the most stable. So um, people use it as a speculative instrument, which is fine. It's just a capitalistic endeavor and they're not interested in participating in the ecosystem. Um, so I think it's a mix of those things. Yeah. I, uh, I really like what you guys are doing. I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down and just have a chat with me, Marshall. I, I'm a big fan. I like what you guys do. I do recommend that people go join your Telegram group because it is a pretty cool group. Everybody is easygoing. Um, and people are just really relatable. And definitely get the, I'm going to list like your website and all your, all your stuff below. You guys put out some really cool Medium articles. And I do encourage people to go and give you some consideration for the next vote. Before I, uh, before I let you go here, do you have any final thoughts for the EOS community or anything else you wanted to say? Um, yeah, I, I would say, you know, it's really similar to like 2012 Bitcoin days where we still have a lot of work to do. Um, but community interaction is super helpful because we can't build stuff if we don't know what you want. Um, so I think that's uh, something that's really needed. And I think being active for a lot of people, it gets weird sometimes. That's okay. Let's, let's just get weird together. That's all I'm saying. So sometimes it's got to get a little weird, man. I get yeah. it. And that's part of the. That's part of it too. I love your attitude, man. I think you're super laid back. I think you're funny, um, very down to earth, and uh, I appreciate you. And I look forward to talking to you again sometime soon. You sure, man? Thanks so much. All right, pleasure, buddy. I'll see you soon. Cheers. <laughs>